My name is Sonal Shai. I'm the executive director of the Beck Center and super excited to be here with both of you, with all of you, and more importantly, with our uh, two incredible speakers that we will have uh, panelists today that we will be working with. Just a quick background on the Beck Center. Uh, Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation is at Georgetown University. Uh, we are focused on really looking at the future and thinking about how to have impact in the communities around us. Uh, we are future forward. We're tapping into where is the world going? How do we make sure we can get there? We are outcomes focused, really looking at how do we achieve the outcomes, not just count the numbers. And then finally, uh, we are focused on action. What we are doing projects in communities, we are working with those that are working in projects in the communities and taking that to think about what is scalable and how do we think about scale. Uh, it is something that we have been working on finance and looking at new financial models to impact communities around us on a regular basis. We've been doing this since 2014. So it's even more important that this conversation on how we change finance to make sure it's participatory, making sure that we are investing in and and working with communities together and really thinking about how to have a big impact in the world around us. So um, it is just my pleasure and a sincere honor to have Dana Bezerra, president of the Heron Foundation, and Lucas Turner Owens, uh, who runs the Sankofa Group, as well as uh, was the former fund manager for the Boston Ujima Project with us, and really excited to be having, having them here with us today for this conversation. So Dana and Lucas, welcome, and super excited to have you both today. Thank, Thank you. Good um, you know, we're super, uh, you know, what's interesting about this timing and especially the importance of this conversation is this is about shifting idea power from funders to communities. Uh, too often when we talk about social impact, we're always thinking about how funders help communities, but we don't ever think about the way communities can participate with us because knowledge exists within communities. It's not as if they do not know what's happening in their own communities. And thinking about how to do that, what are the models? And this is not a new idea, it's not a new concept. Concept. Gosh, we've been talking about this for a long time, but it's a it's a time and an opportunity that has come and we should be having more of these conversations, not less of these conversations. So uh, what I'm looking, what we hope to do today is really to speak to both of you about your approaches, how we grow these ideas, what do we need to do to scale, how do we get there? And, and you know, why, you know, beginning with both of you, why do we think this matters? So, uh, Lucas, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you started, uh, you were part of the Boston Ujima Fund. You have such an interesting origin story about why and, and how you came here. Tell us a bit more about the idea of the fund, how it got started, who supported it, and how you launched it. Sure, happy to do that. And also, thank you for having me uh, to join and to share on this panel. I'm really excited to hear more from, from Dana. And uh, glad to be part of the conversation. So the Ujima project uh, started out of a conversation between grassroots organizations, activists, impact investors, and entrepreneurs. So those were impact investors like Deborah Fries, who manages the Boston Impact Initiative, Nia Evans, who was at the time the executive director of the Boston NAACP, Lisa Owens, who was the director of a leading grassroots org in Boston called City Life, and different social entrepreneurs. And they were trying to answer the question, what would be a catalytic vehicle for change in Boston's working class communities of color? because there was a disconnect between the impact investing work that was happening in Boston at the time and the grassroots organizations who'd been fighting for change for 50 or 60 years. Uh, one piece of work was done downtown, another piece of work was done in the community, and the two were largely isolated. Uh, so the idea emerged, what would it look like to have a financial arm of the grassroots sector in Boston? Um, how could we incorporate the insights, to your point, Sonal, uh, from the grassroots sector and from the community? So the grassroots sector could, for example, tell us what is a fair wage when talking to labor rights organizations? Uh, we could talk to folks in housing justice groups about where should we be thinking about investing when we want to invest in affordable housing in Boston. Uh, and really, our thesis was that in addition to grassroots orgs informing our work, residents of the community are also the subject matter experts on what makes their community great and what it could use more of. So we set out to build a fund that would rely on broad democratic engagement, much in the way that participatory budgeting works at the city level in cities like Cambridge and Boston. You know, Lucas, uh, in, in, since we've been at the Beck Center, we've always talked about how to bring different sectors together. And then, in fact, through the fund yourself, you've done uh, bringing all three aspects of the private sector, the communities, and people to the table, as well as the nonprofit sector. So 
congratulations on that and really look forward to digging in a bit more. Um, and I forgot to mention the more important, the most important thing about your background is that you are coming to Georgetown University to the McDonough School and the Business School. So super excited you'll be joining us at Georgetown and look forward to having you uh, here just pushing us even further. Uh, Dana, in some ways Heron Foundation is the other end of the spectrum. You're a funder. Uh, you've been pushing the foundation, the foundation's been pushing the community and thinking differently about investing in communities and thinking about impact. And uh, I would just love to hear from you sort of how did Heron make this decision to shift more to investing in communities and what have you learned in the time that you've been there? You've been there uh, and you've seen the shifts happen uh, over the years. So we'd love to hear a little bit about that from you. Yeah, for sure. And uh, first of all, also, thank you for having me. And we are quite the fan girl, if you will, of Ujima. So it's nice to share, share the day with Lucas as well. Um, I, I would love to tell you that we decided this was the path we wanted to take. And that for us, that's just really not how it worked. It has been an evolution for Heron. We like to think of ourselves on our best day, though not always as a learning organization. And so we spent our first 20 or so years really working intensively in places, but like most philanthropies, we had decided what we thought were the appropriate interventions for a place based on our philosophy of uh, basically poverty alleviation and community development. And I think we did that well, and I think the communities benefited from things like housing, access to capital, small business development, childcare, and so on. But we never really at that time paused to ask like what it added up to for a community. And then in our second iteration of Heron, um, you know, we had just come through the downturn in the economy and we were calling the question around, yes, it's wonderful that we've gotten to 40% of our endowment invested in accordance with our mission, but you know, now's the time we have to go all in. And for the second period of time at Heron, all of our focus was on moving the endowment to 100%. And importantly here, I'll say at the time, we said 100% for mission. So we, nose to the grindstone, started moving the endowment closer and closer to mission. Um, what we realized, the world likes to say we got there, an important point, we'll talk about where there is. We got there in December 2016. The trouble for us was what we learned in that journey was that where we got to was 100% invested for impact, that insofar as impact was knowable, we could sleep at night. We did not get to 100% affirmatively invested for mission. We learned on that journey that being invested for an impact that was acceptable to us insofar as it was knowable and being invested for mission were worlds apart. And so in our third iteration of Heron, um, we went back to our mission and said, well, how do we get there from here? And Heron's mission has always been, has not changed, helping people and communities to help themselves. Problem, we can't optimize from impact to helping people and communities help themselves if we're not deeply speaking to communities. So we had to go back and for the last two years, really we're rebuilding our communities-based practice and um, learning, relearning how to listen, how to hear communities, how to discover the culture and agency in a place without putting our fingerprints all over it first. And the reality for Heron, and this, this is finally the answer to your question, was that um, we had a bit of a reckoning moment. When we evaluate enterprises, we talk loosely about whether they're net extractors or net contributors to society's wherewithal. And we had a moment where we said, you know, we're really pleased to be rebuilding our relationships with place. The trouble is we're doing that because we think they know what we need to know in order to optimize from impact to mission. Maybe that's backwards. Maybe we're being the extractor. And when you acknowledge that extracting is not okay, and it's never been okay at Heron, that's the moment where we started saying, instead of learning what communities know so we can deploy, I think what we need to do is hand over money and power to communities and then assist them to deploy. So that's how we got here. And then as I'm sure we'll talk about, we went looking and said, surely other people know about this. And of course, one of the first folks we ran into was Ujima. And we've been on that learning curve ever since. But the reality is that's how we got here. It wasn't an affirmative decision. Mm -hmm. Dana, I mean, I, I just want to reemphasize what you said. Um, going from impact to mission. Um, it's easy to talk about impact and get comfortable with impact. 
and forget the mission as to what it is we were trying to do and why we were trying to do it. And again, uh, thinking about just not impact for the sake of impact, but thinking about what it is and are we achieving the mission we set out to achieve and I really really love the way you uh, approach that really love the way you're thinking through that and I think an important question of an understanding that communities do have knowledge maybe we should build structures around communities not have communities uh, adjust to structures because that's the structures we've created. So really, really, I think there's a lot to dig in there and really look forward to having further conversations on this. Um, Lucas, let me turn back over to you and let's sort of get to the core of the approach, the structure, uh, the starting points, and let me be a little provocative and just really think through, because you know, you've heard these questions, so you're, you're not gonna, it's not gonna be surprising to you when funders ask you these questions, but let me ask it up front just so we get there. And then we can talk about the more important piece, which is the community itself in exploring real challenges to, uh, you know, to doing inclusive of strategies. How do we ensure we're being inclusive? How do we ensure, to Dana's point, that we're not just uh, having a conversation about impact but not really thinking? We sort of say inclusion because we think we're helping communities, but we don't actually uh, work through what that actually means. So I'd love to learn uh, to learn a little bit more from about the Ujima Fund. Um, you say it's the first democratically governed investment fund. What does that mean? How did you work through that? How did you think through that? How does it work to run a democratically managed fund? And how did you raise funds? And what were the investor expectations? What were some of the things you had to work through? Great question. So I'll, I'll take those in the order that, that you started. So I think first to the question of how do we truly act in an inclusive way? I think it really starts with creating conditions that feel warm and open and truly inviting to folks. So sometimes economic development discussions don't feel that way. Sometimes even charrettes don't feel that way. Uh, so how do we, so our events looked and felt different. We would have DJs, we would have food, we would have childcare, we would have translation. We would have a lot of activities where you move through space. Like we laid tape on the ground and said, stand in your neighborhood with a big map of Roxbury on the floor. We had spectrogram activities where folks would move to sides of the room to indicate how they felt about certain questions. So I think the, the design of the, of the workshops and the activities and the events themselves were important. And they weren't just to achieve uh, certain objectives for the organization. We've had parties, we had open mic nights, we had events in cafes. So I think the point is, how is your organization truly open and inviting to folks and not just trying to achieve a certain set of objectives and bringing them in to, to give you that, that input only then? Uh, to your question about how we're managed, um, we were democratically managed at the fund in four ways. So first, we would ask the question at those events, what are the businesses you love that are here? What are the businesses you need that aren't here? And what are the ones you'd like to see replaced? Uh, for the ones that folks told us that they loved, that's our top of funnel. Those are the companies that we can then reach out to and say, we'd like you to join our business alliance. We'd like to assist you with capital, technical assistance, relationships to, to buyers. For, folks, uh, for businesses that folks told us that they need or want to replace, that was sort of some early market testing for what might work in a community that isn't already there. Because if we think 500 people tell us they need a, a, a co-op grocery store in Dorchester, maybe that's a proof point that that business might work in that neighborhood. Uh, so the other three ways were, second, the community came up with social and environmental impact metrics. So we drafted a long list informed by labor organizations and different groups, uh, and there was about 50 metrics, and the community whittled it down to about 36 things that they cared about, which I think is a really important distinction to our work because we got out of the way of answering the question, you know, what should impact look like? We said, let's let the beneficiaries of this work define that for us. Uh, and then third and fourth, there's a community due diligence process. So the community would have a chance to ask questions directly to the entrepreneur at the stage when they're being vetted. And then there's a vote. So there was a report that I would draft with revenue model, cost structure, growth projections, debt service coverage ratio. The community would get that uh, and then make an informed voting decision about whether or not they want to allocate to that investment. Um, and then real quickly, just to your question about how do we sort of change paradigms, um, we had to coordinate on the, on the fundraising side, different investors with different return expectations, different risk tolerance. So we did something that um, Aaron Tanaka, the, the sort of visionary behind Ujima thought of uh, and called capital stack equity. And the idea was if we're raising these notes, um, if you have a lot of wealth, you can invest for a longer period of time and that's considered risk. And then you're rewarded with a certain return. But if we're trying to build wealth for communities that don't already have it, we can't say you have to lock up your money for seven years and the more you give, the higher your return will be. That whole premise is, uh, is flawed. It perpetuates inequality. So we, we changed that. We gave 
lower dollar investors who lock their money up for a shorter duration, the highest returns in our fund. And then we situated other investors in the capital stack proportional to what they thought we could thought they could take on. So we had program related investments sitting near the bottom. We had grants for loan loss reserves and we had those community investors up top. Um, so it was, it was an effort to really challenge and change the paradigm to your point around how people think about funds. I love that. I mean, I think uh, just, just sort of turning on its head the idea that the smaller dollar investors who actually probably have most at risk uh, are, are the ones that get their money back sooner than the, the ones that have more that they can leave behind and let them take on more of that risk. I love that. And it's important, right? When we think about, when we think about finance or when we think about economics, that's actually an important part of the conversation of what is actually risk. And what's interesting is we've put the risk burden on people not on investors. And, and uh, what you've sort of talked about is sort of a different way of thinking about that. Uh, and it's an important concept. And what I also, the other thing um, just wanna, Lucas, really just wanna highlight what you pointed out, which is the way you brought the community in and the way you understood what they needed um, was super important. And that's a very important, like just design itself matters. And I uh, love the way you thought about that design. And I think there's a lot we should all be digging into. And I know from the Sankofa group, you help investors think through how they do that as well as social entrepreneurs. So I uh, just want to put that out there. Dana, um, as you mentioned, Heron's at the beginning of its journey, um, but changing designs and power structures, that is hard to do. Uh, changing our own mindsets, changing the way we think about things is really hard to do. Um, how, how are you approaching this approach at Heron? How are you working within your community, which is the community that you work with? And how much work has it been? What's your vision? How long do you think this is gonna to take to even just shift the way we think about this? I mean, I just think about it for myself and I, I, I already just listening to Lucas, I feel like I have to like rethink everything I do. Yeah, we are very much at the beginning. And, and obviously we've spent a lot of time studying existing models and have learned a lot from Ujima and others because you know, when you're a foundation and you ask your colleagues, um, you know, how participatory is participatory, you're likely to get a statistically significant response. You know, the community is X size and therefore participatory means X number of bodies because that would be statistically significant. That's not the type of answer we're necessarily looking for in this place. So I would say there are two different versions of really difficult. One is, the existing paradigms and structures, even as a funder, the mere fact that we show up as a funder, when we often start talking to communities about their, their assets, importantly, and not just the things they want, but their assets, we would often hear, well, what will you fund? And that's a really hard place to reposition the dialogue. It's because the answer is not related to what we'll fund. The answer is really related to what does the community's vision for itself hold in the future and how do we get there from here? Even, even creating, as, as Lucas was saying, the invitation, the space to have that conversation where there's not some presupposed power dynamic behind the ask is really hard. Um, and so we're spending a lot of time, and I say spending because it's an active process for us, we're spending a lot of time trying to learn how to uncover agency in a place and how to uncover culture in a place. Because it's not as though we can show up and establish the culture we think will work. Culture exists. The question is what culture exists? How do we, as the funder, learn to work within it? Um, and then from there, how do we move forward together? And for Heron, um, even already having experimented with a couple of early ideas based on other models, it is different because we're a funder. We have a balance sheet. And so what we're operating on right now, which is an assumption, but it's where we're starting, is that the communities where we engage, based on um, many of them, by the way, either have or are undertaking a participatory process of their own design. So the community was out ahead of us. We're following. Um, we're talking about a local integrated capitals committee that has authority off our balance sheet. And so um, we don't, we sort of, for now, Lucas gets to skirt the conversation about rates of return and because we are the source of capital. Um, but these committees would have deployment authority off our balance sheet. 
Uh, and when people say, well, what will that look like? We say, well, the community will have to design that. And, you know, is it designed to be grants? Well, that will be for the community to decide. Um, we are living in the, the gray space in part because we think for once, it's our job as the funder to live in the gray space and to allow the community the authority, the ability, the confidence, the control to decide for themselves. The, the other answer about hard, um, so that culture setting, sourcing, establishing in the community is really hard. The other piece for Heron that's been really hard is we were not structured or staffed to do this work. We just weren't. Um, we have a lot of great people who do a lot of great work and we are repositioning here in the organization. And by the way, I should say in its entirety, we're small enough that this is not a program strategy we can take on. We are wholesale doing this. It is our strategy. And so as a result, um, we are undergoing some pretty significant and occasionally very painful organizational development work so that we are repositioning so that over time, our sole reason for existing as a foundation is to staff and service these integrated capital communities in places. Um, that work is both underway now and will probably be underway forever as we continue to learn from our community-based partners about what they need from us and how we might go about delivering it. So very early days, but um, very hard, very painful, um, very paradigm shifting inside our walls, as well as outside our walls with our um, potential partners. Yeah, Dana, I, I um, you know, really appreciate the, the, the honesty about how hard this is. This is not a, this is not a, here's a playbook, go use it. This is a, we have to change the way we think. We have to change the way we approach. We have to, and I truly appreciate it. And I also appreciate the point about, this is an ongoing learning. This is, there's no one and done in, in any of this. We're all gonna learn together and we all need to learn together. And I think keeping open lines of communications for that are important, but the design itself is hard. I think one of the things that both of you raise and it's so important, um, but before I move on to the next set of questions really is reminding people if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or you can tweet at us uh, at Beck Ideas, uh, hashtag Beck Ideas. So please feel free to send in your questions. I'm gonna, this is my last set of questions. I will be asking uh, to make sure we leave room for others. But I think what's in, 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 in important in this is that we're not going to go back. There is no business as usual anymore. The world has dramatically shifted. And it's been shifting, to be fair. I think the acceleration has just happened. And um, there, I don't know what business as usual means anymore because I think communities are asking to be at the table because they do have this gap between the haves and have nots has only gotten bigger. Every little thing we've tried actually hasn't changed that. So maybe we need dramatic change and a different way of approaching the challenges, which is I think what you offer, Lucas, uh, through the Ujima project, but all the work that you're doing and Dana as the foundation is, is thinking about this. Um, but as, as we're sort of in this shift and as we are all sort of shifting together, I think there's some important questions in terms of like, how can funders think about building community wealth? Not just how do we help communities, but how do we actually help communities build their wealth so they're owners of, of that too? How do we spread these types of approaches um, and what do we need to do to make that happen uh, not all of them are succeed going to succeed but so what I mean I've never seen every investment succeed in a portfolio either so this idea that we we tend to think that communities all have to succeed at the same time seems seems like a ridiculous prospect in general and then the third is just you know is there a role here for policy should government be participating in this is this just a funder community conversation? Is it a uh, fund community conversation? Should there be a role? So Lucas, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Ujima has gained national attention. Um, you've, you need to raise more capital. Ujima needed to raise more capital is continuing. Tell us more about the challenges of fundraising, uh, why it's so hard to get institutional size support, and how do you think about growth, role of government, particularly at the local level? Where are the communities in what are they looking for from, from policy, government, even the funders? Yeah, so that's it's a great question. I appreciate the, the context for it. I think um, 
when we set out to explain this idea of capital stack equity to funders, specifically high net worth individuals, foundations, uh, registered investment advisors, it was sort of like selling an iPad before someone knew they wanted an iPad. You know, you have to define what it is, talk about changing the paradigm, and then, and then sell them on that idea. So it was, it was really challenging, and I think um, the strength of the idea got us pretty far, and, and I, I think, yeah, that, that's, that's the work. But to your question about scale, the role of government, uh, and this sort of opportunity for wealth building, I think we get there uh, through, through growing the markets and growing the sort of contracts of the companies that we were seeking to invest in. Uh, and I think that that happens through procurement. Uh, some of the companies were direct to consumer and Ujima did have a strategy there, but for the B2B companies, I think the role or the strategy should really be procurement. Um, so I'm lucky to be in a group right now sponsored by Common Future, uh, which is bringing together practitioners to think about policy and big ideas that could potentially shift our field. Uh, and one that I think about is um, if we're trying to invest in black owned businesses in Boston, and if we know because the Association for Enterprise Opportunities put out a report that says 95% of those businesses are sole proprietors making less than $30,000 a year, then who can we really invest in when we raise $10 million? A lot of folks would approach us and ask for a walk-in freezer for $10,000, for example, but there weren't many businesses approaching us for half a million, a million dollars. So when I think about scale, I think about that challenge. And I think you can, you can get there by effectively having city government both collate contract opportunities and then mandate either with a carrot or a stick, but I would propose the stick to say, if you're a large company, let's say over 10 million in revenue and you don't spend 10% of your procurement budget on work done by MBE, minority business suppliers, then you have to pay a fine. And maybe that money goes into a technical assistance pool for those same vendors to get whatever support they need as they scale. Um, and to give folks a feel for where we are now relative to that 10% number, some states do stipulate that if you get a state contract, you have to have X percentage of MBEs and WBEs, but that's not enough. I mean, in the city of Boston, MBEs got less than 1% of all city contracts. Uh, and that happens in a unique way. I'll just take a minute to tell this story, which is that right now there's an RFP process for most things that the city puts out for bids. And only certain companies that are on a list will even be alerted about that RFP. So if you're not on that list, you're not alerted, you find out late, you try to apply, you can't, and the cycle's not open up again for another three years. So that's how we got to that less than 1% place, is that it's not an open and fair playing field at all for small businesses that want to be vendors. Um, so I think to get us there, we need some kind of analysis. So what's the discretionary spend that corporate, uh, large corporates have? What's the opportunity to switch from large national vendors to local suppliers? And then there's going to be opposition because there's going to be some dislocation. Um, so there need to be some sort of governing logic about who gets replaced. I wouldn't think that we're necessarily trying to replace a three-person white-owned HVAC company with a three-person black-owned HVAC company. Uh, we're trying to replace a large national supplier with a local MBE. So I think there need to be some analysis and logic defined there as well. Yeah, Lucas, there's a, yeah, a lot of concepts in there. But can I ask you a quick question just as a follow-up? Um, where you did see the succeed in uh, contractors hiring or bringing in uh, companies or governments bringing in minority contractors, what was it that made it work? Relationships, social capital. I mean, I, I wish it was because um, that you know that's problematic. But I think what a good example is we spoke with folks at Children's Hospital in the Community Affairs Department who got us in touch with folks in the Supply Chain Department. We brought in 15 businesses to effectively pitch the director of supply chain, and one of them got the right to vend on the site of Children's Hospital's campus for a day. But it was social capital and putting the folks in supply chain directly in contact with our businesses, while we also stood there vetting them and saying, we've assessed them for social and environmental impact. We're ready to provide capital if that's what they need. We have a network of technical assistance providers. It was that combination of things that led to good outcomes. Yeah, and I think um, a couple of things here that I just want to sort of highlight what you said. One, the fact that the Ujima Fund used its social capital to help small businesses is incredibly important. Like, who has access? When you're a small business owner and you have three employees, you don't have time to go do all of that. You're sort of just running your business. So I think the work that you are doing in that is is super critical. The second uh, thing I think is important and that you highlight is sometimes we go to efficiency, which is like which companies can do it now and we don't actually think about effectiveness, which is what is it we want to do versus what is easy to do. And the easy part is where we sort of end up as opposed to really thinking about what is it we're trying to achieve. And that might take a little bit longer and a little bit more work but it's important that we uh, that we think about that and and relationships. I mean, right? 
we all forget how often we use our relationships and we don't talk about those relationships and why they matter. So I think it's important uh, that that highlight is so important. So thank you for raising those. Um, I'm sure and I'm seeing that there's more questions popping up. So I'm sure there will be many more questions coming on this. But Dana, I'm going to turn to you for a second um, and really uh, talk, it, talk about sort of um, as you think about spreading inclusive practices and approaches and the role can, that foundations, you, you talk to lots of foundations, you're talking to different foundation uh, CEOs, but groups and others, and how do you think about it? And then what is the role that you think foundations can play with policymakers, with governments, in sort of really sort of asking for different approaches and pushing for different approaches? How do you think about that from where you sit? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think more foundation folks run from me these days than talk to me, but, but, but I take your point. We do occasionally talk to each other. Um, you know, it's funny. I think at Heron, because we've never had the investment side and the program side, they've always been integrated. One of the places I think there's real leverage in the system is, is playing both sides. So for example, if you're deep in a community and you're, you're getting clear from the community on what their intentions are for their place, and just to use an easy one, let's say more affordable housing, for example, then it is very easy as a foundation, because we're an asset owner, to switch hats and go speak with the HFA, the Housing Finance Authority, and say, you know, your community seems to believe there's a lack of affordable housing and in one case, this is real data, the community hadn't issued mortgage revenue bonds in more than a decade. And so being able to call that question as philanthropist and ag advocate, but also as potential investor for those bonds, why is this not happening? What is the disconnect in the system? And then being able to deliver the technical assistance, because that's often what it is, to help get the wheels of capital markets working in service to what the community's vision for itself is. Um, so often we find that the capital markets bonds, often municipal debt, often in a place, is completely disconnected from the narrative that the community holds for itself. And so being able to stand on both ends of that and say, you know, we're hearing through our role as philanthropists, these things are the community demands. As investor, we went looking for that in the market because surely that's a need you're servicing and we can't find it help talk us through where it is and if it's missing, why it's missing. And being able to say, we'll be standby buyer for that. Let's do this thing and we'll buy it. So you can de-risk the system to get the system working. And importantly, because this is often a critique we take, um, I'll, I'll cite my friend Charles Eisenstein, who talks about that we are as a society in the space between stories. You know, the current economy that created wealth inequality is broken. It is on hospice, stealing from Deb. It is not working for most people. But the next economy hasn't materialized yet either. And so we're living in that space. So for Heron, um, what it means for us to live in that space is that we are willing to tinker at the edge of the broken economy to get better bonds issued, to get better companies up and running in the current broken system, recognizing that's tinkering at the edge of the broken economy, that we're using our dollars as philanthropists and midwifing investments from the next economy into this space. That's, that's the cognitive dissonance that we're willing to hold and that we talk about. Be intellectually honest. When are we tinkering at the edge of the broken economy to have better outcomes? And when are we trying to manifest the next economy? And so for foundations, I think um, there is more to be done in levering our power as a business enterprise ourselves. Um, the world of impact investing has gotten very comfortable, I'm pleased to say, talking about more than products and services and trade lines. They now talk about how a business operates in the world. That's the finger I referenced earlier. I'd like to turn back and point at foundations. It's great that we do good things in our program strategies. How, what is our aggregate effect as an operating enterprise? From the vendors we use very much, we have procurement as Lucas knows. What are we doing about our procurement? Um, for our colleagues who are issuing bonds, because this is a hot topic right now, who's your book runner? Who's your selling syndicate? Are those MWBE, was that part of the consideration? That is part of your economic footprint too. 
not just your programmatic strategies. And so I think there is a lot more to be done um, on those fronts. And this notion of midwifing, knowing what you're willing to buy as investor and pulling it forward into the market is a real gap in the space that I think foundations, if they choose to, are uniquely suited to, to help fix. Um, and I can't help because we like procurement too. We like to disaggregate spend and figure out uh, with our partners, figure out what portion can be localized. Um, and the number one factor, at least in the things we've touched, has been incentivizing your procurement officers to do what you want them to do. Move their cheese, change their compensation, and people will respond. Yeah, you know, both of you mentioned Dana, and thank you for that. Thank you for that passionate approach to this too, because I think you're right, which is um, we can't get comfortable saying we try to do the right thing and not really think through every angle by which we can do the right thing and what is it going to take to get there. But also both of you emphasize the importance of data, looking at that data differently, disaggregating it differently, understanding what and whom we're helping, how we're helping, what are the things that we need to change. And the approach to capital markets, like we can look at capital markets in a different way. Just this idea that the capital markets run this way, therefore we can't do something is not enough. Like, how do we change the muni bond structure? How do we help cities run muni, muni bonds differently and, and issue bonds differently? That's an important question. And we are in the midst of reviving, changing capitalism. And I think it's important that we think about how do those capital structures actually help people. So I really love that. So let me leave with you with one question quickly for both of you, if you can answer it quickly, which is one, uh, Dana, let's just start with what's the one action you would encourage others to take? And again, please do send us uh, your questions via Beck Ideas, hashtag Beck Ideas. What's the one call to action for foundations and philanthropy from your perspective? Well, I'm gonna cheat and go with two. One is you are, you are a financial institution, you are an enterprise. It is not okay to just focus on your impact through your programmatic strategies. That's not what we ask of everybody else. It's not okay for philanthropy. Um, I think the other one is deploy your capital, deploy it. We are tax advantaged for a reason and it has been long overdue that we are called to account for the tax advantage that we have and that making money with money is not our chartered purpose. So deploy your capital. Right there with you, 100% uh, agree. I think it's so important. I think we we get comfortable, um, and Dana, and then just to quickly to your point on this, which is uh, we get comfortable that our job as financial fiduciaries is to bring more money in, and we forget about the reason why we're doing it, and we spend more time on the fiduciary side and much less on the impact side and what we want to do, and rethinking about that. Lucas, same. What what might what might be steps that other communities can take to design and support projects like Ujima, um, like the work you're doing through Sankofa? What are the types of things you would recommend? Yeah, I think, you know, it starts with sort of an asset lens through which you look at a community and say, what are the unique attributes that make this community so special? What are the things that we could leverage? What are the relationships that we hold? And the we there is expansive. I mean, residents, uh, folks in faith communities, folks in grassroots organizations, um, folks in civic groups, um, because I think, you know, in Boston, we focused on procurement because we have a, a healthcare industry here that anecdotally has like the GDP of a small nation. So that's an opportunity for us. Uh, but in other cities, there are other assets that they could leverage that could help make this whole thing work. I think, you know, big picture, what we tried to identify is sort of mutually reinforcing systems, mutually reinforcing strategies from to the point about procurement, building relationships there, building relationships with the city, building relationships with grassroots organizations and existing at the center of that hub. But you can't have a strategy that works unless you first correctly assess that broad community that you're trying to serve. Absolutely, and I think that's so important. I'm gonna uh, first say thank you to both of you for answering my crazy questions, but I, I really appreciate your passion and the work that you're bringing to, and I've learned a lot to, in this conversation. I've talked to you both, but I've even learned more in this conversation, so thank you uh, for that. I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague uh, who, who manages all of our fair finance work, Andrea McGrath, and have her sort of ask you questions that the audience has been sending in, because uh, as much as I love asking questions, I think it's important that we, we, we see where the questions are. So Andrea, I'm gonna let you come in and ask questions if you don't mind. 
Thanks, Sonal. And I might be not videoed for a while, but I will be in just a minute. So um, thanks to you. And thanks for this is such an interesting conversation. We've gotten a lot of questions, uh, as you can imagine, from the audience. I'll try to do them justice. We definitely got, I would say, Say groupings of questions that are about community and groupings, of course, that are about foundations and your approach. So let me start off with the community. I'll ask to each of you specifically, but both feel free to weigh in. Um, one commenter really underscored that the, the urgency around these models that are engaging community and helping to build community wealth, highlighting a lot of the stats that we've seen already about this huge disparity between house, white households and households of communities of color. So, but let me unpack some of the questions that came in around community. One comment was really in thinking about community that you actually need to allow them to define it for themselves. But specifically towards the questions, we had um, ones around thinking about communication. I mean, Lucas made a great comment in talking about the city of Boston, the procurement, and how to access those opportunities. There were a number of questions thinking about how are you sharing the word or engaging with communities about your models? How are you thinking about what communities you want to engage in and whether different communities can help lead or engage or develop these approaches? So a few all together, but Lucas, let me start with you and then move to Dana. Um, yours being really localized with Boston but how did you think about the communities that you engage in specifically as you had mentioned the challenges of outreach and engagement to make sure people are understanding these opportunities exist yeah it's, it's a really quick answer which is just that we looked to the existing grassroots organizations that already had really deep reach in communities where we wanted to uh, to be effective and impactful so we partnered with a group called uh, let's see city life Vita urbana which i mentioned at this housing justice Reclaim Roxbury, which was thinking about gentrification in Roxbury. We talked to groups thinking about environmental justice. We talked to groups thinking about uh, specific labor rights issues. And, and we basically use the, the network that they already have to turn out folks to our events where the conversations are genuinely overlapping. I mean, folks might not think they are who are funders or maybe in economic development, they might think, oh, that's a housing conversation around you know, residential housing. This is a conversation about businesses. But if we're talking about a mixed use development and there's gonna be space for business on the first floor, we're talking about it all. Um, so we would often try to partner with orgs and build the bridge for their already existing networks to say, here's why we're at the table for this conversation. Here's why we think you have information that we need to know about wh wh which way this should be headed. Yeah. Yeah. And Dean, I might turn to you as well. I mean, you're very connected to the groups you fund, but Lucas and Eugenia clearly is such a localized model. How is Huron thinking about the different communities it wants to engage and 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 uh, in this process. Yeah, so it's an imperfect answer and in full transparency, although amongst the 129 of us on this call, just amongst us friends, it's a question my board is constantly asking. How are you picking communities? How do you know? How do you decide? And the reality is we keep stiff arming that question because what we know we're looking for is some version of existing agency in a place. We, we know we can't work in a place if either based on where they are currently or based on what philanthropy has taught them, they're asking us, what should we do? What will you fund? How will it go? That's a non-starter. We're not smart enough and we don't have enough money to make something happen somewhere. So we're listening deeply. We're watching press. We're reading local news. We're talking to um, networks like Common Future and, and the fellows um, who really do a great job of identifying sort of unofficial marriage in place. We're, we're listening deeply for communities who have some sort of agency, even if the community is not completely aligned, whoever is, but there's a voice that's, or voices starting to emerge ideally around, we want to be something different in the future and here are the the things we think we want to be we spend a lot of time talking to organizers what's the word on the street we spend a lot of time i know this is super nerdy but reading city council minutes what are the issues who's speaking out against it let's go talk to them <laughs> um you know what is what is the predominant point of view what is the counter point of view who's missing you know so it's it's both data driven and really really qualitative and um, I know that on the one hand feels like a total non-answer but it's also frankly completely transparent for where we are at the moment yeah 
And that's great. Let me, let me pivot because we definitely get, as you can imagine, a number of questions for uh, you, Dana, and about the foundation. But I think Lucas also can weigh in from his experience with Ujima and fundraising for Ujima. So so specific, specifically about when you were looking to adopt the, um, this approach, what pushback did you get from the board or, or others, key stakeholders, and how did you navigate those? Um, and then the second question I want to unpack was a lot of questions really uh, wanting to understand how this works with your staff as well and thinking about the organizational transformation needed to support these new strategies. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm very happy to say that at the Heron Foundation, we have never gotten pushback from our board, not on going 100% for impact for mission and not on this. When, when we went to the board and said, you know, we're afraid we're becoming a net extractor um, and we need a different point of view, through the arc of that conversation, the board said, then this is what you need to do. It's what you need to do. You need to figure out how to do it, <laughs> but this is what we need to do. So no pushback from our board other than they ask every month, if not more frequently, how are you deciding? I would like to know how you're deciding. And, and again, it's we have that conversation, but I, I and our staff, we're stiff arming it. I don't think there are a series of metrics that we can identify. There are some for sure, but I don't think there are a comprehensive list that will work. Um, so there's that. Pushback from others, lots of folks don't want us to do this, um, in part because, honestly, I think the space gets tired of Heron, and I get that. Um, but I think the idea that we're really trying to learn and are willing to fail and be wildly imperfect along the way um, is something sometimes people don't like, um, but that's okay with us. And then on the staff front, you know, change is hard. And anytime you share with a staff um, that your emphasis is shifting, and, and important to note here, by the way, Heron is still not words we use, but the rest of the world does. We are still an impact investor. We are still optimizing every position in our portfolio every day from, for example, really nerdy things like from multifamily housing bonds to an optimizing step would be a multifamily housing bond in a community where we work, where the community has affirmed that that property is well stewarded and is not a problem for the community, where that property is offering wraparound services and families in it are experiencing mobility. That kind of stuff is still very much a conversation in Heron's quote investment portfolio, but it is a full feedback loop with our community's practice. And nonetheless, when you announce a shift to say, look guys, we have to go the direction of putting power and control in the hands of communities, there are staff who will opt out. That is not what they get up in the morning for. It's not what they think about every day. Um, and there are different skill sets. Uh, Heron's archetype, if you will, another nerdy word is servant leader. If you cannot bring yourself to listen more than you're talking, and if you cannot bring yourself to go into the field to collect information and share as appropriate, then you can't work at Heron. And increasingly, especially given the transition in the world, you know, our staff is always discussing that we don't believe you can do this work unless you have done your work. And some people aren't there in their own personal development. They haven't taken it on, they don't want to, whatever. So there's a variety of, of change that's created in the staff, some driven by individuals on the staff opting out and some driven by organizational needs. And that is always painful because it's not performance driven. If uh, speaking to all the employers out there, if you have a staff person who's under deploying, there's a process for that. We all know what that looks like as professionals. This type of change isn't that. It's just that the organization needs something different to be able to help accelerate what the community wants for itself. But it's painful nonetheless. Yeah. Um, there's so many good questions that I know I'm gonna to try to be condensing these, but I really wanna make sure I articulate this one for both of you. As you can imagine, lots of people, and we're highlighting both of you as really doing pioneering approaches and models. There's been so many questions about how do we start? So if we're a foundation that hasn't been historically set up this way, how do we think about starting and leaning in? And likewise, Lucas, you know, your Ijima really grew from some really interesting community meetings and discussions. How, are other, how can other communities think about moving from that to a 
establish a fund. So Lucas, maybe I'll start with you um, in a what, what is your advice for, for folks in other communities that are, would really be interested in building a model similar? Yeah, I mean, I'll make a shameless plug and say that we are now working with some impact funds that are looking to think about that exact question. But I think that there's a stage before that where you're thinking about what are the entrepreneurs that we know we might be able to serve in this community? What are the affordable housing or other investments we could make in real estate that could benefit this community? Having enough discussions and being tapped in enough to know that you're moving in accordance with what the community wants. Uh, and I wish there was a rubric or a strategy I could say that gets you there. But in truth, the founding team at Ujima came in with a lot of social capital. I, I, I had volunteered with grassroots organizations in Boston my whole life, counting diesel trucks that drive through Mattapan to see how many were stopping in that neighborhood where my dad lived versus another neighborhood. So um, I came in knowing some of these grassroots orgs. Nia and Aaron came in knowing these grassroots orgs. And we were able to effectively bring out community to give us guidance and to then ultimately be elected into governance bodies within Ujima. That's something I didn't really touch on, but we have a democratically elected standards committee that would review sort of the social and environmental impact of companies using those 36 standards I mentioned. So, you know, to answer your question, I think it has to start from the place of what's here, what needs capital, what's already loved, uh, not the idea that you just need to add something new, but what's already loved that needs, you know, a facelift or storefront renovations. Uh, once you've sort of sized what that pipeline might be, then you can think about what kind of capital you need to raise, how to structure the fund that might adequately serve that pipeline, and then think about networks you're already in as you think about the capital raise. So um, I think those would be the, the first sort of three big buckets I would think about. Yeah, that's great. And Dana, I think you've kind of addressed this in various points throughout the conversation, but I might combine your advice with a question that somebody asked, which is like, why isn't this happening more? So how do you think about, you know, what advice would you give for foundations or other funders that really would want to lean into this work? Yeah, so the only website domain I've ever owned in my whole life, stumble forward, just stumble forward. Be wrong, be bad at it, um, be transparent. Make sure your partners are willing to go on an imperfect journey. Know that you're co-creating. Hold space for co-creation. Um, just start, stumble forward. And I know that's old advice, but um, for us, if we, you know, stealing from Brene Brown, nobody wants us to wait until we tell our perfect story. Nobody cares about your perfect story. People want to know where it really sucked and where you really messed up. And there's, there's camaraderie in that too. And so, you know, as I tend to say all the time, it's not the cheap seats that are interesting. We don't have time to hear the people in the cheap seats throwing. You've got to get in the arena and we're going to be bad at this. People are going to be critical and that's part of the journey. Um, as a parent, you know, I, I go all the time to my parenting place. Like if you can't raise resilient children if you're not willing to demonstrate resilience. And for us, that's true at work too. Wonderful. Well, speaking of time, I wish we had more of it. This has been so great. And uh, thank you to all for the wonderful questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Sonal to um, wrap us up, but thanks to both of you as well. Lucas and Dana, I can't thank you enough for this important conversation. And again, I want to just bring out three sort of critical things that both of you have said in different ways. So one, trust. We have to build trust with communities. And the assumption has always been about trust with investors, but we've never sort of turned that question to ourselves and said, do the communities trust us? And there's a reason we are where we are in the world today is that communities don't trust that we actually understand where they are and what they need, and we don't bring them to the table. So trust is important, but trust also works the other way in the way that Lucas sort of pointed out, which is he had trust with investors and was able to bring them to understand what the communities were asking and how to make sure they were getting the capital. So trust matters and we need to, we need to build trust, not just rebuild it, but build it and make sure that that happens to uh, get in the arena. <laughs> Dana, love that comment, love the point, but it, it, even with Lucas, I think he was saying the same thing. You have to get in to know what you're doing. You can't just design the perfect system. There is no perfect in the world we're living in. We're learning, we're muddling along, we're gonna figure it out, but be willing to do that. Frankly, if we're foundations, if you're investors, if you're thinking about communities, it is the moment to be thinking differently and to muddle it through and sort of stumble along the way, as you said, 
Dana. And then finally, um, as both of you have been talking, is just thinking about, we get so caught up in this term scale, like we have to do bigger and better. I think scaling might be just from what you all are saying, scale down. Do what the communities need, then think about how to replicate it, but don't just think about how big can everything be, but really thinking about how do we start with where the point is, which is where are communities, what do they need, and how do we do that, and, and, and not just scale up, but scale in, scale understanding, and how do we help communities but figure that out. So uh, really, really appreciate everything that you all are doing. Um, know that we're following you, learning from you, wanting to continue to learn, but this is a journey, and we have to, we have to moment this is the moment in time to switch that journey and not just co get comfortable with what we're doing. So thank you both for, for your leadership, for your willingness to take this on, and for willingness to push all of us. Really appreciate it. And Lucas, can't wait to see you at Georgetown. Um, so, uh, and, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Samia, who's just going to give final comments uh, on what to, what, what's coming up next at BEC. Thank you, Sonal. Before you go, know that we'll be sharing the remaining questions with our panelists. Look up for a follow-up note from us with some of the high-level takeaways and ways to engage further. Uh, be sure to join us on September 29th as well for our next event as we explore how, to intentional, how intentionally designed experiences can transform education and prepare students to tackle complex problems for social impact. And please feel free to continue via live tweet using hashtag Beck Ideas. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, not only about this idea, but also about any emerging ideas that we can include in future sessions. The series is meant to spark new ideas and collaborations in unlikely ways. So we hope you found this one to be a simulating dialogue as well. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day. <laughs>